goes down. Yeah, so we don't refract back off the ionosphere. We're just shooting right through it. Yeah, because the, the, the better angle we have facing the sun in the summer uh, agitates it more, and it stays agitated longer with it right after sunset. Is that what well, you're saying? I understand it. I mean, <laughs> so what you're saying makes sense. You know, it's like living downtown. At night, it's hotter down there because the buildings, all the concrete absorbs the heat in the streets, as opposed to in the desert up here. Uh, you know, it's ten, it's ten, you know, degrees colder or more in, in the evening. That makes sense, Terry. Well, that's the way I understood it. I don't know. No, it's good. I like it. It's stored potential energy or kinetic energy. The stored potential energy is stored greater and longer in the summer months because of how intense the sun is. That sounds good anyway. Sounds good. Sounds good. I like it. All right, David? It's the angle of the dangle. That's what my dad used to say, too, yeah. My dad, when we used to go out when I was a kid, he said, leave the pots in the closet. I don't remember that one. You know, smoking pot. Oh, no, no, no. My dad wasn't there, no. But the uh, dangle is dangle, yep. Dangle is dangle is one. What else? Uh, we used to cut paper clips in half and use rubber bands and shoot them. He says, be careful. You put someone's eye out. We never saw an eye fall out. Oh, that was always, yeah. Be careful with that. You're going to shoot somebody's eye out. I remember that one. Yes. I can say it that way. I didn't know that. I mean, every cycle is different. You know, the average cycle is 11 years. But, uh, you know, they kept on changing. You know, first they said this was going to be a Miranda cycle that's going to be no activity. You remember that? Then they changed. Because they, they don't really understand the, the sun about cycle and, and why it, it, it's so uh, a, a variant. No, I, I, I agree with you with that. The, the, the last cycle was the terrible cycle. just for ham radio, but I mean, I don't know about the rest of the world. I don't know if the rest of the world cares about radio propagation. Randy, you there? I'm sorry? Uh, KD6 BIS. I was just talking to this guy, uh, uh, VK5FIL there. Having a little expedition over there on um, Flinders Island, South Australia. Oh, Looks like a nice place. It's about 30 miles, 25 miles off the coast of South Australia. Is uh, South Australia where Melbourne is? I know there's a uh, kangaroo island down there. Anyway, it says it's uh, IOTA, uh, Flinders Island, OC-261, Worldwide Flora, Flora uh, Fauna, Investigator, Important Birds Area. All right. April 14th to the 21st. SBK5 FIL, but I looked him up on QRZ, he's got like 250 contacts. So you gotta go and look for Flinders Island there and to find it. Anyway, I talked to Montana earlier, 
the clock this evening before the band dropped out. Anyway, Randy, I thought I'd let you know. Why would he care? <laughs> I don't know. He must not know that guy very well. How hot was it down there in Phoenix today? Where'd you go, Clark? Man, there's people everywhere. about the readers. He's like, uh, did you look at the meters? No, I don't know. That's what 
brand new primered, all that stuff. I don't know who's gonna buy it. brand new uh, Ford 250 uh, hoods. There's all kinds of stuff there. Cummings, uh, new. Whatever happened to Bram? He's still around? I'm on my Yakimo. Yeah, okay. yeah, I think he was just thinking the radio's up. It sounded like him. I'm on the Yakimo. The Yakimo and the cactus patch. This don't have 11 meters. He's over hanging out with Cliff. Oh, hold on, let me, let me clear my pipes. I am on the Yesu. The 901 DM. Oh, it sounds great. It's off a little bit, but it's moving around slightly. Yeah, they do that. You can leave it on for a couple hours, so it'll be nice. <coughs> you got the matching speaker hooked up. Yeah, anyway, when well, you get well, it at two o'clock in the morning, you'll be able to. It'll be all settled in. <laughs> what uh, what microphone? The Uniden. Okay, yeah, it sounds pretty good actually. It's a hybrid. It's, it's half CB and half M. It says it's 500 ohm, a microphone, and I have went through the box of all the microphones I had, and this one was pretty good. Yeah, I wish I had room. I'd like to set, set those up again and just play around with them, but I just don't have anywhere to put them. It sounds really good. I didn't remember that it sounded this good. I was going to hook it to the, the monitor speakers, but I said, well, no, let's just put the regular speaker next to it. And uh, I, I was kind of surprised. Yeah, that's a really good radio. I, I actually kind of like my 901 more than my 902. I, I, I don't know. I, I go back and forth, but uh, I don't know. The, the 901 is just uh, it sounds a little better. You think it's just that mixer thing? It's got a different front end on it, yeah. Yeah, it's got a different VFO and a different front end, and I don't know, it just doesn't, uh, uh, I don't know, you have to have them side by side, but I just, I, I had the 902 for a long time, and I went back to the 901, I'm like, the 901 is better down here, it's just got a fuller sound, it's just a little, you know, just a little bit less noise, and the 902, you know, has a little bit more hash, you know, high-pitched noise, but I think the 902 definitely works better on the higher bands. I can't stand that hash, though, man. That's really, you know, tiring after a while when you just listen to all that hissing noise, you know? Yeah, the 901 is smoother. It's just, it's just got smoother audio. And it's not the alignment or anything else. I, I went through the whole thing. It's just that, that that's the way it is, you know, that, that front end is... Uh, it's just different. It, it's 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 a later one, like a 101 ZD or something. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I can't remember what the if the 101 ZD. My 101 ZD is pretty mellow, actually. Um, but um, it's probably out of alignment too. Yeah. Well, not no, probably it definitely has to be. I mean, and it's been golden screwdriver, so I mean, it, it could be all kinds of bad stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would love to find a wider filter, uh, but I just I don't think they made one. You know, I mean, I, I searched the world over. Uh, Inrad made one at one point, but uh, I, I can't find one. And you know, they're probably all they're all sold out for years. Uh, but that that would have been nice because uh, you know that that's the problem with all the older radios is. You know, I think that thing's 2.4, so, or 2.1, might even be 2.1. It's pretty narrow, I think. Yeah, and I mean, that's what they did to get performance, so, and that's fine, you know, it, it sounds okay, you know, it's just, it works great, you know, if you go up on 20 meters, that thing is a DX machine, you know, but down here, it, it just doesn't have that full sound. And uh, that, 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 that's ultimately what, I, what would always bug me about those. And that's why people always know when you're off frequency just a little bit because you're already very narrow. 
So then if you move 20, 40, 50, 100 hertz, they're like, oh, you're all frequency. No, they don't even say that because people today, they don't understand what frequency is. They think it's channelized. So they say something's wrong with your microphone or so, your, your microphone doesn't sound right or, uh, you know, your, 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 your radio is a problem. Well, wait a minute. Hold on a second here. Let me, let me just adjust the frequency. Oh, it's fine now. It works as it should. The same person says it works as it should. Yeah, well, that means it's broken. My loss, your gain. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see that in an auto trader ad, Terry? You're done. Oh, you know, yeah, it's got bad rod bearings or something. It's just a joke. I mean, uh, they don't know what a VFO is. My loss, your gain. Don't have time, kids. I dumped engine honey in this thing. It, I hope, uh, we're hoping it makes it home for you. That, that's what that means. This thing was smoking the neighborhood out. We put Bardol in it. We put four bottles of Bardol in it. Come and buy it. It was worse than a, a, a Mazda B2100. They drain the oil and put AMS oil in it, and then they fill it with STP. <laughs> Hyper lube did work on that damn Mazda. I had a Mazda that uh, this guy was working for and wanted me to drive, and it, it was low miles. It drove just fine, but it would smoke out the entire block at a stoplight. I had a Scirocco, um, second second generation Scirocco Mark II, and uh, uh, it was bad, real bad. Uh, whoa. <laughs> It, one of the cylinders, um, I, I don't know why, I, I never really figured out why it did this, but the other three were fine, but the one, it burned so much oil. Uh, I could get, I could get like to school and back for maybe a week and it would start misfiring real bad. I'd pull that plug out and the whole thing had growths of oil deposits on it. I had those oil spark plugs you can get. Oh man, it would start to smoke out the intersection. Yep, I'd pull in there and get the uh, Bardol no smoke, dump that in there, get a new spark plug, a spark plug anti fouler. Remember those? Raise the spark plug up a little bit, uh, and then I get like a week or two, yeah. and then then it was back to square one. Uh, but I did that for like a whole summer here. Uh, I didn't have a choice. I didn't have any money. I had to get to school. I remember uh, we used to use those anti fowlers at the at the car lot. So when we were down, when I was a uh, teenager, you know, to get something with oil burning like that, you'd pull them out, and put all those in there, and cha you know, like change oil, put uh, AMS oil in there, and, and or fill it with uh, something else, and and get it to not smoke just to sell it. Did you ever hear about the oxygen sensor trick? Bad, but yeah. Um, that's, that's what they do. I gotta run down the hall, be right back. K6RWB. Yeah, hey, wait, 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 the crankcase, Terry. Yeah, while you guys are taking a break there, uh, we could I pass a little traffic on the net? Go for it. How you doing, buddy? Oh, just fine. Um, K7SC, K7SC, are you listening on this frequency, K7JEB? Yeah, Jim, K7, J-E-B, K7, S-C, any copy at all, over? Oh, boy, you're very weak, uh, Jim, very weak, as well. I thought it, it would be, um, uh, Clark, I was wondering if you are, can hear him any better uh, than I am. Uh, he's barely above my noise. I think you want uh, to get a drink. I sound fine in Santa Barbara. Yeah, he's on a vertical. He is, uh, has to have an HOA. He's on an HOA limited uh, flight pole vertical out there in uh, Sun City. He's making it, but not very strong. Uh, who is that in Santa Barbara? It's K7 SC. Uh, kilowatt Delta 6, Bravo, and yet here it's Alex over here by Santa Barbara. Here about S8 with the attenuator on. Thank you very much. Your S9 with me. <laughs> 
Prescott Valley, you're about a 5'8", KEG 7 h r Thank you for the 5'8", okay, I'm making it up north. Anybody else? Well, I'm about 5'8", and uh, I'm
Yeah. Have a good night. Seemed like when I ran a bunch of power with the Hustler 5B TV, it kind of did a little bit uh, okay for local. Yeah, well, you know, when you run a vertical, you've got a gnaw going right straight up, and that's kind of the direction that we like to propagate our signals. We, uh, we're actually doing NVIS, uh, but uh, don't tell anybody, and don't tell the CD people or the races people or or Mars or anybody like that. They think they own that thing. Oh yeah, the Mars aliens? <laughs> Well, I, I use this loop, and that's my preferred thing, so I know that it, it, it definitely radiates that way. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, a good, that's the way to do it. Um, you, you have um, both horizontal and vertical, depending on, you know, horizontal going straight up, and then vertical squirting out toward the, uh, toward the horizon. When I had both of them hooked up, I, I never once ever saw where the vertical actually ever outperformed my loop, but I'm sure there's probably a case where it would be better, but I, I haven't seen it. Well, uh, the way you get a vertical to really perform uh, down here on 80 meters is you get an old uh, Cadillac uh, Coupe de Ville, uh, all rusted out and everything. <laughs> you park it right next to your vertical antenna and you running a 75 meter mobile out of a Cadillac Coupe de Ville puts in a slam dunk signal. I don't know why that is, but that's the way it goes. Yeah, or the cadaver lock. Oh, that's the, uh, that's the premier example of that. Oh yeah, the cadaver lock. Yeah, that thing used to just pound out the big signal. Gentlemen, I shut the amp down. It's cool off. Uh, 373, catch you on Monarch. 86 RWB. See you later. Yeah, have a good night. See you later. See you later, Gary. Yeah, uh, Jim, I don't, I don't know. I think we've probably talked about this before, but years ago I had a, uh, a northern radio receiving system, and uh, it was basically two SP600s. And uh, Northern Radio modified these things, and they hooked together. Um, there were some extra controls and whatnot on the on the front panel, uh, but but it was a, a dual diversity. It said so one of the receivers got the vertical, the other one got the horizontal antenna, and uh, the 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 basically one one was the master, one was the slave, but. When you when you sat there and, and like listen to shorewave or 80 meters at night, whenever the band would fade, the other one would get the boost. So um, every time the the horizontal the signal on the horizontal would fade down, almost exactly that level that it faded down, the uh, vertical would increase, and they would trade back and forth all night. But this thing leveled it out. You heard both at once uh, through the speaker. It, it was really cool. Oh, that's a nice, that's a nice setup. Uh, <laughs> two SP600s uh, tied together uh, in a diversity reception thing. Yeah, that's that's way cool. Why'd you ever get rid of it, Clark? I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I had my fun with it, but if you look up Northern Radio and SP600, I, I said there used to be a guy's website. And he had the whole thing, and of course they they called the whole uh, system, you know, one military number. But um, I, I I stumbled upon it somewhere at a ham fest. I don't really remember. It's been too too long. But um, I got the one, and I realized, uh oh, uh, this is like something something different here. Uh, and then I got the other one, uh, and I had to I had to modify the second one to make it work, I believe. Uh, but yeah, they, they hooked together. I, I don't know exactly how it worked, 
but the IF somehow hooked together, and yeah, you just tune the one or, or tune the other, and uh, it was just mesmerizing. You know, you sit back at night and listen to short wave and watch the two S meters trade places. <laughs> Uh, 
I'm just speculating on what's, what, what would be required. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I have to Google it. I haven't, I haven't Google searched this thing in many years, so maybe it's not out there anymore. But I don't know. Some guy's probably got a website about it. But um, I remember that you had to hook the two IS together. I, I, I do remember that. That was a, a BNC cable. Then there was a series of terminal strips uh, connections that had to daisy chain. And then I, I want to say there was you know, there was yet another one, like another BNC. Yeah, I don't know if that carried the uh, the, the VFO down or what, but yeah, th th there was a whole series of interconnecting cables to make this thing work. Yeah, that kind of sounds right. Um, and um, yeah, if they um, if they had a, um, a, de a common detector for each IF strip line. Yeah, uh, that would be uh, kind of getting elaborate, I guess. Anyway, uh, but uh, that would have been that would have been a heck of a thing to play around with, to, and, and uh, you said just to uh, just to watch a, a signal uh, fade in and out um, on the different uh, different antennas. Yeah, it was really something, man. I mean, I I was just it was a real eye opener because. You know, when, when the band fades, the other antenna picked up where that one left off, and that, that was my point, you know. Um, it, it just was amazing. I remember uh, one night, I was on late at night on 80 meters, and uh, uh, there was a big group out there, and I was using this to just to listen to them. And uh, I noticed that the one guy, he uh, continually pounded the receiver with the vertical antenna but then you know the very next guy that would key up he'd be over on the other s meter and this continued only him only him and so uh it, you know curiosity got the best of me and i keyed up and he said no i'm on an 80 meter vertical yeah <laughs> and probably uh, talking to you on ground wave rather than sky wave that guy was out um Oh uh, gosh, I think he was in New Mexico, and uh, uh, was he? I think it was New Mexico, and he had a um, he had that gap um, 80 meter vertical. I think they called it a Challenger. It was like 40 feet high, and I remember looking up his call sign, and he had the thing mounted on his roof, uh, which was a big production to get that thing up there. But that, that, that's what he had, and uh, yep, that, that, that's, uh, that northern radio system just sat there, and he would just blast in there. So he was as loud to me as everybody else was. If you turn that off, then, of course, I couldn't really hear him on the, uh, on the uh, horizontal uh, dipole. So that's when I realized how powerful that is. Oh, yeah, you know, that's... Um that's something, and that's just diversity, um, that polarization diversity. If you had, um, uh, if you had the receiver uh, uh, separated, uh, you know, several wavelengths apart, you'd really see a difference. Um, um, because uh, that, that way, um, maybe have so well, you know, <laughs> I think the standard operating procedure was to have three of them. Oh, well. If you all, if you had them all the, using the same polarization, like a receive site for, um, I don't know, transoceanic um, communication or something. Um, but yeah, that's the other diversity. Anyway, uh, but yeah, that, that's that's way cool. And then, you know, you see stuff like that it becomes part of your experience, part of the, part of your know-how. Yeah, I mean, thinking about it now, I, I believe my, my 7800 would do exactly all of that, right? Because it, it has two completely independent receivers. Um, yeah, if, well, you, you'd have to, um, you'd have to have them, uh, you'd have to tie the AGC lines together. And, uh, and again, um, get, get a common LO for both of them. I don't know how easy that would be to do, um, given the fact that, you know, um, it's 
calling Capsule and Surface Mount stuff these days. Yeah, I was just thinking that it, you know it has two independent receivers. Every control is separate. The, they're, they're actually the same receiver, so one doesn't perform better than the other. There's six roofing filters, three on each side. Um, it has, you know, two volume knobs, two RF gains, two DSPs, two everything, you know. So I thought maybe if you had, uh, uh, and, and you can set those to receive, which is nice. So if you, if you key the thing up, it won't blow the, blow the other one out. But um, I was thinking if you had a vertical on one and a, and a horizontal on the other, I guess you could just turn up the volumes and you, you would have a diversity, right? Well, you'd have to do the signal summing in your ear. Uh, I think that's what it would boil down to. But yeah, I could see um, putting one, one in your left ear and one in your right ear and um, uh, a pair of earphones and... Um, uh, if one guy comes up, uh, you're hearing him and not, nothing in the other ear or so. And particularly if you ran, if you ran uh, manual gain control on both on both receivers, so that the AGC wasn't pulling a lot of noise on the um, on the channel that was faded. So yeah, you could do, do something like that. That would be. Um, that would be an interesting experiment, um, not requiring any uh, transceiver modifications or anything like that. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So, I mean, they, they obviously use the same audio amplifier, so I, I would think that they're not using the same AGC, though. Yeah. I, I, I think the, the audio summing is handled because they... They, they, they both feed the same audio amp, so as long as you had the volume set correctly, uh, you would be handled there. But you're right, the, the AGC is not, it's not tied together. So you, you can set which receiver goes to which left or right, because the thing has a, uh, uh, two audio outs, left and right. And, or you could do just both to one, which is the way I have it, because I only have one speaker. So you could split the audio, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's not going to be exactly the same, right? Because the uh, uh, you you can tie the VFO together. You can have one one uh, VFO control the other one. Uh, so you could do that. But uh, yeah, the, the AGC isn't tied together. Well, here's the thing: if um, if you have enough receiver dynamic range, you could. Um, you could put them in um, manual gain control, both, both receivers, bring the left and right audio out, um, run them both through a um, sum, sum them together and run, uh, let's Damn see, it. Well, probably the way to do that would be basically, um, um, Two, two AGC amplifiers, two um, audio AGC, or two <laughs> compressors, basically, and have them bust together at the audio level, or at, at the audio, in other words, bust them together, do your AGC summing at the audio level rather than at the, AG, at the RF level. If you're doing sideband, there's, um, that would work just fine. Uh, AM might be problematic, though. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, that might work. Yeah. Yeah, anyways, that's just a topic of conversation. Yeah, maybe I should have kept those, but I don't know, man. You know, those things are uh, 80 pounds apiece, and with the rack and the speaker, all that. I mean, that was just a massive receiver in there. That's not cool. Yeah, uh, that was the thing. I, um, um, quite frankly, um, uh, I really love that SP600 in terms of its look and feel and, you know, old radio uh, atmosphere and whatnot. And, um, uh, but, you know, after a while, like you say, I, I just got tired of hauling it um, around the shack and trying to get it set up one way or the other. And so finally, uh, there was this guy who was rebuilding SP600s. And so... I, uh, I moved it on to him, and um, he was very 
happy to get it. Um, I think he actually used it for spare parts uh, for some of his other stuff. But, um, but in, in any case, um, it was um, and it was an SP600. It wasn't the JX model, or uh, it was the original, um, you know, non-crystal control type, um, non-military. Receivers sitting on his desk, 
they had this great big rubber pulley uh, uh, stretched between all the tuning knobs on all the receivers. So that when this guy was was scan the band, uh, scan one band, he he was also tuning across every other Marine band. Uh, that KFS monitor at the time, which I think was about uh, three or four bands per operator. So they were, uh, and they were going great guns. I mean, that, that was just uh, an incredibly busy place. Uh, and uh, it convinced me that I, I would never want it to be a CW operator commercially. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. I wonder if there's any photos of that thing. That, that is unreal. I should have taken one. I should have taken one. Um, but uh, at the time, I was just overawed by the whole thing. That was the first uh, uh, coast, uh, coastal marine station that I had seen, um, and it was uh, it was all inspiring. Well, with that, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I got the uh, red slicer capacitor in the uh, SR2000. And uh, um, anyways, the the thing I don't understand this. It's bolted to the side of the chassis, right? So the the frame of the cap is grounded. I mean, it can't possibly be grounded better than that. But for some reason, they have a uh, a copper wire. You know, the the uh, a thick, heavy wire that goes from the frame of the cap down about four inches to the back of the SO239. Well, that just hooks to the chassis. So what, what, what the hell is the purpose of that? Um, I mean, what, what, what could it possibly do? Well, the only thing I can think of is it's absolutely positively guaranteed that um, the outer conductor of the um, coax that you have connected to it goes to the uh, frame of that uh, loading capacitor. So even if you've got uh, grunge underneath the uh, the mounting holes or the mounting screws, bolts, whatever, um, of that capacitor, you still had a had a, a solid a solid connection 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 between the um, the coax and the um, loading capacitor. Yeah, I guess it just the yeah, I guess it just was secondary. I mean, yeah, you know, maybe they didn't want the current to go through the chassis, but well, I mean, the damn thing's bolted to the chassis. But uh, yeah. Uh, anyways, that, that that's proven to be very difficult to attach. I spent about an hour uh, uh, coming up with some hardware, drilling a hole, you know, uh, soldering a ring terminal on the thing. But uh, uh, I'm I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put it back the way it was. The the, the other capacitor had a little tang that uh, that came off of there where that that wire uh, was crimped and soldered, but of course this new cap, cap doesn't have that at all, so I'm having to kind of adapt it. But about halfway through.